Welcome to the Workology Podcast, where we discuss the science and art of the workplace, gain powerful insights, resources, and perspectives on the industries of human resources and recruiting. Join your host, Jessica Miller-Merrill, Chief Blogger at bloggingforjobs.com, for an in-depth and no-holds-barred look into the future of our most powerful business asset, the employee. And now, welcome your host, Jessica, with this podcast episode of Workology. Hi guys, and welcome to the Workology Podcast. Thank you for making us part of your week. Today's topic is work values. Why do people do the work that they do? And our guest today here is Ryan Mead. He's the founder and CEO of Vitru. Welcome, Ryan, to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Jessica. So uh, before we get into the topic, and because, you know, we were actually talking about this before uh, we hit the record button about, you know, why we do the things that we do, but... Tell us a little bit about you and your background, and how did how did you get here? That's a great way to start off the podcast. Um, I, I actually have a background um, out of out of college. I started in the banking and finance world, um, honestly chasing the dollar. Um, that's where economics placed placed its weight to me. Um, I believed in relationships, so for about twelve years, um, I had had the opportunity to grow and and lead lead bankers and and areas in finance but then one of our clients was in need of um in need of an hr growing a growing company of about 600 employees didn't really have a solid hr foundation and and uh, talent acquisition strategies and that's where i was able to be successful in banking not so much because of what i could do it's it's because i i could select and and maybe develop the right talent, if that makes sense, Jessica. So I parlayed that into, into the world there. And for about five years, I, I transformed that, that HR department, that HR company. Um, and that led me to saying, wait a second here. Why is it that we would look at similar candidates or we would, um, um, we, we would try to vet the best that we could, but ultimately when they would get into the culture or, or they would become part of the team, some individuals would flourish and become um, um, integral parts of the team or the organization, and others said, I just, I just don't fit here, and, uh, and they would leave. So that led me in end of 2011 to create what you see today in Vitru. I think the job fit is so important and culture. And, and I say that because the current economy that we're in is very positive, right? So jobs are being added, but the market is extremely competitive. Right. And because of that, I think it's more important than ever for hiring managers and recruiters to make a really good decision or the best decision and make sure that that person's going to stick around because if you invest all this time and money and effort into bringing somebody on board and find out that they're not the right fit or maybe they go somewhere else, that just delays the whole productivity or the business process. I grew up, this will date me so everybody that's listening, I grew up, uh, you know, after school and things, watching Sesame Street. That's the three channels we had, you know, here growing up. But um, there was that old skit that just said one way, this, you know, this goes one way. Um, when I graduated college, really hiring and, and and joining an organization, Jessica, was one way. It was, what can I do to present myself as a suitable candidate to join that organization? In other words, I had, am I looking the way of the part? Do I... Do I speak the way? Do I have the proper education? Do I have all those ram- those uh, prerequisites that I need to join the team or join that organization? Today, it's the organization interviewing the person as much as that person is interviewing the organization. And that's never been that way in the world before that it is today. That's why you have to have your employment branding strategy, your recruitment marketing strategy, and you need to, you, you can't just uh, provide your candidate with just the general information about the job because that's not good enough. I mean, no, pe- people don't, people don't join an organization to do tasks. They just don't do that. Especially those millennial workers. Yeah. That's, that's a whole different topic for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> We're talking today about work values, why people do uh, what they do. So um, let's talk a little bit about this. Let me let me get into to where we're going from here. So we've okay. all we've all had it had it happen. We hire somebody and their credentials. They're supposed to be fabulous. We think they're going to be an amazing addition to the team, but maybe they just don't fit 
into the organization or that group of team members. It, it's, it's terrible for everybody. We've, we've been talking about this. But let's talk about first um, maybe a little bit about culture before we start okay. talking about culture fit. You know, that, that is a term now since we started Vitru, like I said, in the end of 2011, that's almost being thrown around, and, and I don't want to say flippantly as in that we don't give it credence. It's that we say, oh, it's a culture fit. How am I measuring that? What really is that? Um, and it's a classically wicked problem. Um, it's, it's like um, you and I were talking off air about big data. You know, wh well, what really is big data and what really is culture? Some of our customers and some of our clients, um, the, the classic example is, is it's, a, it's a startup. And the culture of that organization is really that, that uh, uh, the values that one or two individuals brought into uh, the beginning of that organization. But as it grows and it, and it matures and it adds individuals, really that culture becomes the values of those employees that you've attracted and those values of those employees that that actually are doing the work today. It's interesting that you're talking about culture fit and it's the values of the employees, not yeah. of the business leaders or the edict that comes from the no. top to the bottom. It's the other way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we say, we always, and you talked about it earlier, like I want to make sure my employment branding is right and make sure that I get those things. But the reality of it is, is that your employees, the team members on your team, they are your employee brand. They are your culture. They're going to go out at night and they're going to go have beers with friends or they're going to go on a vacation with some neighbors. And, and on, honestly, they're going to talk about the work they do. They're going to talk about why they do the work they do. Tell me a little bit about it. That's the culture of your organization. It's not some mission statement your, your managers did at some retreat somewhere and came back and posted on the wall. That's not it. And yet we are so concerned about the activities online that are, I guess, demonstrating our culture fit, like the glass door reviews. Like we've done a few webinars on blogging for jobs and I always get a question like, what happens if somebody says something bad about me online? Huh, that you should be so lucky. Yeah, at, and, least, and I, at least they are giving you some information or some feedback, right? Exactly. I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of like, um, I've, I've been married long enough, so I, my wife will probably kill me for saying this, but when you stop telling and, and, and telling me the truth, then you no longer care. So there are reasons why they would post something on Glassdoor or do things. I'm also a realist. Um, it, it may be vindictive or they're doing it out of vengeance, but for we always say this. Why wouldn't you give your employees open access to social media to share your information? If you're scared Zappos has done it forever, if you're scared about what's going on behind those doors, <laughs> at five o'clock or when the when the bell tolls, it's going to come alive. Agreed. And you know, probably the best. And I was telling Josh Berry this when we did the interview. Like the the two places that I went to find out what was going on at a location or a retail store, or a call center that I oversaw, was I go to the break room and just sit yep. in the break room, or I go to the smoking section. So that's sort of, unfortunately, like online is kind of where the break room and the smoking section sort of meet. But at least you're getting feedback so that you know what employees think about you or your team or the company. You know, that's hilarious that you say that. Do you know when we, when we do work with schools, do you know where we get the, 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 the honest feedback about what's going on in a public school? From the lunch ladies, and I say ladies because it's always been ladies, and the janitors. They'll always tell us the truth about the, the, thick, the friction going on, et cetera, because they don't feel like they have a vested interest. They can tell us what's going on. It's funny. It's a comfortable, they're, I mean, but they kind of are. They're kind of, a, a, in a way, like everybody, I mean, when I think about when I went to school, I always, we always, the guy that was the janitor, his name was Jay Diamond. He was the guy you went to, like, to tell him your problems or to ask him a question. He was your guy. And, and they always see, it's, it's interesting, they're peripheral, they're that secondary, tertiary um, point of contact that they can see. They have a, a unique vantage point of what's going on. And Jessica, I, you can speak to this, I can speak to this as, um, as, an organi as, as an organization that comes in and helps people. We have a unique point. We can see things going on from, boy, what's going on in one of our manufacturing clients that really could, could help in a retail location, et cetera. What's the difference between being a uh, consultant versus someone who is, you know, internal, like you're part of the system. Like I don't have any political affiliations or uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest and 
give feedback and um, help guide them in, in a direction. And I'm kind of neutral. I'm more neutral than, than anybody else if you're, if you're coming into the organization for, to serve a, a, a project purpose. That's right. That's right. Well, let's talk about a little bit more about culture fit, uh, and maybe have you share with us some work cultures you've witnessed. We talked about Zappos, but maybe a few others, maybe from government, corporate, or maybe even small business. Uh, are there stereotypes in these different entities, or is there like a standard culture for each of these spaces, or do they kind of run across the, the gamut here? Um, um, transparently, and uh, when we started the company, I thought there were going to be um, stratus or verticals that that definitely had um, some predisposed cultures in other words uh, 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 an organization that emphasizes you know monies or rewards or, or et cetera that they would start attracting and hiring individuals that 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 gravitated towards that or um, like I read a Dilbert the other day do you do you read read Dilbert at all um, I hope that every HR lady reads Dilbert because yeah. I love Catbert and I and I think he's the evil HR director. Uh, here's what I read. I I pulled this up just for our call today. Is is it said this one? It said uh, the bosses says we need to foster more of a startup culture to drive innovation. So Dilbert goes. So we get to dress casually, work flex hours, feel that our work is valued, and maybe even get some equity in the company. And the boss goes, what would be the name of a culture where people work really hard but don't get any of those things you just mentioned? So <laughs> I totally I, – that's our, that's our stereotypical idea of what big company or, or um, uh, corporate America looks like. But here's what we found out. We cannot paint a wide brush and say, here's what IBM looks like or here's what um, a large company looks like. Because really what that culture looks like is how are those individuals on that small team acting as a, a unit? Because that is where culture is really um, the most powerful. So we would start seeing in retail locations, why is, why is this group of retail agents at, at one store blowing it up they feel like they they have low turnover they're they're hitting their numbers they're they're feeling like part of a, a team and over here they're not again same you and i talked about that up down mission statement doesn't change they maybe even have the same manager um but it's really those individuals that make it up so i want to go back to the consultant reference we talked about that but when i go to your guys's website at, yeah. at govitru.com it's it says you don't need a consultant to tell you how to build your team and then my very favorite part at the bottom it says we built the sandbox now you build the castle so talk us through the mentality these ideas. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly because you're like wait a second here ryan um there's a couple reasons for that is number one as as we as we began and we've grown and matured as an organization, we're still really young. We're we're definitely not um, a big player in the market this way, but but no one uh, has said assessments are are to have great assessments is just that's not how we make our money. So Vitru doesn't make money by selling assessments. We think that great science needs to be at the fingertips of every single organization. Um, you, you don't have to pay $89 to Gallup to get a strength finders to only print it out to put it in a three-ring binder and, and get together. So what Vitru has done is we've created a delivery mechanism that allows you to send it out to everybody on your team. And then in real time, you can compare yourself to people. So you can say, okay, if I'm going to work with Jessica, I can compare myself to Jessica and go, wow, here's where we have similarities in our work values. We do this, we do work uh, and we come into work because we both love innovation and we love creativity and we love teamwork. And you know what? Structure doesn't mean a lot to us. And we're both extroverts. So we know if we're going to spend some time together, we're probably going to have to get somebody that can do the details. I think you've been reading my Strengths Finder I have, 34 I because. I I, uh, I I I've take I've retook the Strengths Finder recently, and uh, some friends of mine here in Oklahoma City have a, a all day workshop which I've went to, and uh, uh, so when I sit and have lunch uh, with a couple of my girlfriends who've went through it, we always talk Strength Finder. So I, I it can be so helpful. And they are. I mean, and so so that's what we've said is is we're not unlike unlike others in the assessment world. They'll always say, Hey, this is our great assessment. Take this. Take that. 
And we don't think that's a bad value proposition, but what we've said is we want to be considered like Dropbox. Dropbox never says, we have the best cloud storage you've ever seen. Here's our security. They say, it's really easy to use. Here it is. You want to save a picture? You want to save a document? Just drop and drag. It's right here. That's what we have said about Vitreous. Finally, somebody's made uh, science at our fingertips and allowed us to use it and not have to print it out and do those kind of things. I love that because there are all these assessments and everyone kind of has their own favorite, right? Or, you know, maybe it's Myers-Briggs or, or whatever the, your flavor of the week. There are a million and they all, the disc, they all provide you good information. But the, the problem that you mentioned is you put it in your little binder and, and you stick it into your shelf and then you don't see it until two years later uh, and it, it does no, no one any good. That's right. That's right. And, and honestly, this is things we talked about before is, is as our workforce is, um, is spread out both physically, um, both on projects and off projects. So in other words, you may work on, uh, you know, Jessica, you and I may be on a project together for uh, 60 days. Well, then we don't do work together again for another three, four, five, maybe another year. But if I had your Vitru profile, just like your LinkedIn profile tells me what you do, I can then hop back online and compare ourselves to the project coming up and go, oh, that's right. We also have Bart and we also have Amy and Sarah working on this project. Here's how what we're going to look like collectively. I remember that now. I like that. Like it's a little refresher so you can kind of think through uh, your, your plan or your strategy. Yep, totally. I well, just said the word totally, didn't I? You oh did, and, and it's okay because, you know, this is, this is a family show. All right. Well, so it's clear to me in talking with you, and so far I'm really enjoying it, and I'd like to think that anyone who's tuning in right now is saying, wow, this guy has a lot of energy. So I feel like the topic that we're talking about today, which is work values, why do people do what they do, it's pretty clear to me that um, you are loving what you're doing, and um, why would, you know, people want to work with people like that. So um, it's super important. It's super, I mean, I, I, here, here's the thing. We are, are a small team, and um, what we've been asked a lot about is, is how, can I, how can I attract people that are just like me and they, we can assimilate them into the culture? And I think if that's your goal as an organization, that you want to attract people that are just like you and that you want to assimilate them into a culture – then you're then it's going to be tough. I mean, our team is built up of uh, built out of really diverse uh, backgrounds, very diverse goals in mind, um, and definitely different talents and skill sets. But together we come together and and we just you kind of complement each other. You you want to push each other and and support one another. If you have a bunch of the same people, carbon copies, you don't. There is no creativity or uh, different experiences or really. And you're a bunch of robots. You, you, you do. So you, I, that question you asked earlier is what do I see? What do we see when we go out and meet with organizations? And the reason we say no consultants needed is, is we want people to feel like they can get in and start using Vitru from day one. And, and they'll start seeing, wow, this is how it's more. And then if they want more help or they really want to go, go really deeper dive, then call us. You know, just, just ping us and say, we want to know more. But we don't, but a consultant isn't needed to get you started. Um, but, but my point on that is, is that we've had some organizations that have recruited and tried to build a culture around one person's success. In other words, or a handful, like these three people have been really good at this job. We have to hire more people just like them. But the truth of the matter is, is that they aligned really well with the manager or they aligned really well with the vision of what the job was, not so much the culture. I think that most maybe HR recruiting professionals or maybe business leaders that experience and have maybe done a lot of high volume recruiting for maybe a large facility, like take for a call center, for example, you mm -hmm. can see that because people operate and work differently under different supervisors, but not just one strategy or way of doing something is the only way to be successful. Right. Right. And, and I, we're coming out just so, just so everybody knows, we have a, we have a product offering that's coming out here um, this summer that's called Vitru Select that allows you to, um, to associate a group of at least five. Our, our, our research has shown us that you need to have a, uh, at least a collective of five individuals. And you can just, it's like you're on Twitter, just go click, 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 click. I, and it automatically associates those five people together and go, wow, what, or more, it can be up to a hundred and go, 
what unique characteristics does this association of people have? And so you could say, wow, that's a location or wow, these are top performers in sales. What do these 15 people all have in common or what don't they have in common? I think that folks will be really excited about that because there's always that, what if we put this team together? How, how would these folks work together? Or why does this uh, group of uh, inside sales reps work better than, a, than another group together? Or if, I'm, if, if you're going to promote me to manager and I'm going to manage these 15 individuals or you're going to ask me to move to, you know, in your case, Oklahoma City or like me in Nebraska and go, OK, I'll transfer my family and we'll do that. But I'd like to know what the team is made up of. What, what do we have? What are we doing here? Y you can do it without imploding the organization. Just hop online at Vitru and see. So and that's not a product push. So I, I just don't want people to think I'm doing that. That's not what we do. Well, so let's bring this back to the kind of the beginning when we were talking about the, the changing job market, right? And yeah. how candidates are asking more questions. So companies are being interviewed just as much as candidates are. So if you're taking a job and you're relocating, why wouldn't you? If, if I was gonna uproot my family and take this big risk, I would wanna know. So it's, it just kind of follows the line of, of where you're going, uh, but you know, you're looking at maybe internal promotion uh, within your organization. We have, we have a large insurance organization, a, a nationwide insurance agents uh, in life insurance that has used Vitru in ways that, again, we said we built the sandbox. It's fun. Like, we have a, we have a vantage to be like, I never thought about using it like that. Wow, oh, cool. Show us how you're doing that. And what they've done is in their recruiting and their selecting, they'll, they'll, they'll actually juxtapose uh, a candidate. And again, this is this. This takes guts. This takes transparency in the recruiting process and in your culture to say, here, Sarah, you look like I'm going to compare you to your manager. Your manager is very different from you. Or they could say, look, you look like three of the top people in this branch right now. You have the same, you know, God gave you things that they have. Um, I think you'll be successful in this position. Or this organization did it this way. They said, look, I know you applied for this job, but I'm going to show you, you don't look like anybody in that role. What you do look like is some of these individuals in a completely different role. Can we talk about maybe this role? Because we like you and we think you need to be here in this organization, but not in the role in which you applied for. So totally surprised us on how they were doing that. One of the questions I wanted to make sure to ask you is because you um, are – you do consulting, but also you are in human resources technology company. So a, a lot of the folks who are listening in are talent acquisition leaders, HR leaders. And so they don't necessarily come from like the, the service sort of tech side of things. And you guys have a patent for, for one of your pieces of your assessment tool. Can you yep. talk us through a little bit about that? I'm just curious. And I think probably others are as well. Like, how does that work? About the patent process? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be I'll be a non CEO for a while. It's long, hard, and it sucks. It's it's a very difficult process, but one that if you um, we have a very good um, intellectual property uh, attorney, so that's what you need to do. You, you need to um, intellectual property attorneys, patent attorneys are uniquely positioned in the vertical um, of patent law. But ours isn't really around the assessment. Ours is around the ability to compare people in real time. So, um, you know, if you take a Myers-Briggs or you do um, a Strengths, et cetera, nothing has allowed you, uh, software, to allow you to immediately compare people. That's what our patent's around, that actual technology of saying, you know, selecting people and finding uniqueness in real time. Well, let's take a little bit of a reset here. This is Jessica Miller-Merrill, and you're listening to the Workology podcast powered by Blogging for Jobs. Today's topic is work culture, why people do the work they do with Ryan Mead. You can connect with Ryan on Twitter at GoVitru. That's spelled G-O-V-I-T-R-U. All right, let's get back to questions here. And let's talk a little bit. No topic about work culture can be complete without mentioning the multi-generational workforce. Mm -hmm. Do you guys look at those data points when you are assessing um, or providing more information? Right now, we are not. Um, and so that's... That's kind of a money ball question. Uh, those of you that are that follow big data and follow, uh, you know, that that idea of understanding, um, there are there are definitely, and, and I'll speak just 
briefly to this because industrial psychologists that may be listening, they'll say that I definitely don't give it due, due credence. I find it very interesting that the multi, the new generation of workers, we always say they don't have a work ethic. You know, they, they will make, we'll paint with a really wide paintbrush. Oh, they don't work hard. They don't do things like that. And that's just not true. Um, what, what we have found in our research is this, that the, new, the, the generation coming out of college probably have more passion and drive to make an impact in the organizations than we've ever seen before. Um, but they do it with conviction. Um, they they want to work on on work that's meaningful. It's, it's what what we're finding is really hard. And Jessica, I don't know if you've seen this. Is that is when you have the generation gap of you have a fifty something leading a twenty something. That's what's hard. There's a little bit of tension. Yeah, I mean because I started my career in 1995 and I didn't even talk about you know. Um, and I'm not 50 something. You didn't talk about promotions and what's my next opportunity. You're just like, okay, you want me to be here at eight? Fine, I'll be here at eight. You want me to leave? Okay, we all leave together whenever the work's done at, at 10 o'clock or what have you. Well, we didn't ask. Today's, today's workforce is, they'll do that same thing. They'll work tirelessly. They'll work passionately with amazing talents, but they want to do it because they know they're working on something that's impactful, not because my boss told me to. I, I find that with my team as well, and 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 they uh, and and they're going to ask you questions, and and they'll say things that are like, I would have never said that to my boss ever, ever, ever in my <laughs> wildest dreams, but they're asking the question. They do, and 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 there there's a sense, and and I've learned it on our team too, is that if you can't answer those questions, then I need to take a step back and go, why why the heck are we doing this? Maybe I'm doing it because. Because my old role of just that's how we manage. That's probably a lot of it. I think you know. Well, uh, let's let's talk about um, existing employees. Can you? I mean, I, I'm assuming that this the Vitru yep. assessment can be applied not just to new hires, but also existing employees, and even maybe like your church group or um, an association. So like maybe like the state SHRM council wanted to to work with you guys and kind of see how they work together. They could take advantage of um, your guys's tech. Absolutely. So when you use Vitru, it was actually our our mainstay was not for job seekers. It was not for the recruiting process. It was saying we've made an investment in this team and this is who we have. I need to make sure that I can motivate and drive and understand why they're here and put them on the right roles. Um, but Vitru is built so that um, you can build organizations and then send invitations out from that. So um, like Ryan Mead, I could start um, um start an organization called Vitru and send all my connections that we do work with in Vitru out. And then they could either see each other. I could give them a seat to, to, to the organization. They could see each other or they'll just share their information with me. But then I could also say, you know what? I also coach uh, baseball. Let's say I coach baseball and there's 20 of us on the board of directors for baseball. I'll, I'll create a baseball board and send it out to them. They don't see each other, but it, it helps. I mean, again, that's free. That's totally free to do. I, I better I better get started. Ah, hush now. <laughs> no, it's true. Um, it's, let's see. Let, I I want to talk a little bit about you know we're talking about people why people do the work they do. Yeah. And we talked to uh, we talked to and mentioned about large organizations. We mentioned Zappos. We mentioned IBM. Um, but you don't have to be an IBM or a Zappos to have a great culture or to have a group of people on your team or within your organization that are really passionate. How does, how does one get started? Where, where, do they, where do they sort of begin? Great cultures made, and I, this, is, this is away from Vitru, this is away from anything on the, I'll just talk about what, what I think great culture is because um, it's not a, um, if you talk to Round Peg or you talk to Gallup or anybody in the vertical, we, we cannot say that this is what great culture is. If you build your organization to look like this, you will be successful. You have strong employee engagement. You'll have no retention issues. You'll be able to recruit the best people. That's just bogus. But the truth of the matter is great company cultures that are successful have one characteristic in mind is that they offer transparency. Um, that means transparency in the application process. That means transparency in uh, the onboarding and the growth within that organization. Uh, transparency to what the managers say to one another between between divisions, and most importantly, it offers transparency in what is the mission for being there. If 
Um, we had some of our customers um, that they're really driven on, on um, uh, profitability. That's what the board of directors, that's all they really care about. But what they were pushing down to, and I say that correctly, they were pushing down to the rest of the organization, was safety. So when we talked about what was important to the organization, it was safety, 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 and, and those type of things. Well, then that didn't align with the culture of the leadership. So again, there was no transparency in there. I think that transparency is, is something good to think about, but if let's say I'm the head of HR, how do I get started in, in becoming a more transparent organization? Do I have the tough conversation with my executive team and say, this is where we need to be, or um, should it start maybe for, as a, from a groundswell up? I mean, is there, there's no magic formula, right? So. That's, that's, I literally, that's a wonderful, I, I wish I had that answer. I wish that I had a roadmap of, um, that's transparency on our part, isn't it? Um, I don't, I don't have the answer to that, Jess. I do not, I don't have the answer to that. I don't, I don't think anybody does. And that's probably why, uh, the culture side of things and, uh, why the hiring side and the retention side of, of talent is so challenging. Yeah. It, it, it's making my brain hurt a little bit. It's, 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 <laughs> you see it cramping up. It's, 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 um, I think it's very, um, I think it's very unique for organizations to lead with their culture as the calling card to attract and promote talent. Um, we all talk about it, and we say about it, but um, I think if you ask frontline employees what what's important to them at their organization, and you ask managers or leaders what's important to them about the organization, and if there is misalignment in there then you need to go back to the drawing board. And that's, that's maybe, as I'm thinking out loud, if I was an HR practitioner or um, a leader in my organization, and I'd say, I, want to get a, I really want to get a good idea of what, what the company culture is. And that's what Vitru helps a, little, you know, a lot with. But I'd say, why are you here? What is it that makes you come in and do the work that you do? And just you ask those questions because managers of those individuals, we've been – We've been very good at promoting great doers, haven't we, for a generation? You know, if you're a really good um, designer or you're a really good developer, what do we always do? Well, you're going to manage developers then. You're going to manage designers. I'll, I'll promote you. When in essence, that's probably not what we should have been doing for a generation. And now we're living with that. And here we are. And here we are. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. Where can people go to learn more about you and, and what you do? You know, on there's transparency. Go. Our website is very limited right now on purpose. Uh, GoVitcher.com. I always just say, just hop online and just start. Um, it's really easy to do. If you want to build a profile and go there, it takes about 20 minutes. You'll learn about your work values and your personality traits. Um, and then send a couple invitations out to some friends. Uh, but if they want to contact us, just send me an email, ryan at govitru.com. We live in modern world. I, I always have my phone with me, and uh, I'm always <laughs> too much in the office. So um, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. I mean, if, if you start using a product or you have questions about um, how, how can this help, we'll tell you if we can help you or not. It sounds like to me a really fun activity to for that like monthly manager meeting or maybe your team building. You put them through um, through this, and then uh, kind of just open up the conversation. It's uh, You said a word that's awesome, and I'm not going to twist your words because I love this. But see, for, for, a gener for our time, we always thought we put employees through something. So we would go and meet with HR, and they'll say, I want to put my employees through something. And the last time I checked, no, no employee wants to be put through anything. True. That's what, like, mashed potatoes get done. <laughs> what, but what Vitcher does is, let's just do, this is for us. Because I can't lead you any better if I don't know why you're here and vice versa. If we're going to put you on a team, I don't want to put you on a team that's going to suck. You know, so I'm not – and so don't take that wrong, Jess, by me pointing out. But that's truly our HR mentality going, I have to put my employees through this. Mm, not really. So, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm left, like, perplexed like where because I didn't even think about it. But you're absolutely right. And, and it would be something that I would normally say, like, let's – Let's put us through this assessment or this activity next Tuesday from two to four. Exactly. And, and I was in that same world. And it's, it's just interesting as we meet with employees and things like that is that 
people want to be able to share. If they're going to share that information with you, it's very important to them to say, okay, why am I sharing my personality traits and the values in which I come here? You know, um, I, I, I'm sharing that information in hopes of us making a more cohesive team. Again, it goes back to that idea of transparency. If, if I share this information with you and you share yours with mine, that's that first step in transparency. Said much more eloquently than me. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Ryan, for, for joining the podcast today. And, and thanks to you, the listener, for joining. My name is Jessica Miller Merrill, and, and this is the Workology podcast where we discuss the science and art of the workplace, HR, and recruitment. Until next time, you can visit Blogging for Jobs to listen to all our past Workology episodes. Production services for the Workology podcast.